And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our OC Speaker Series event. We will be getting underway shortly. And as we bring more uh, people in on our session today, I'm Dan Rogers, the Executive Director of the Kelowna Chamber of Commerce. It's a pleasure to have you with us today uh, for this event. Uh, as we begin our fall schedule of the Okanagan School of Business Speaker Series, and we will bounce potentially, depending on what happens between online and in person, um, depending on how uh, we progress on our battle against COVID. And we will keep you posted. We are planning our next one to be an in-person event, uh, but we will roll with the changes and that overly used word pivot as uh, necessary. Before getting too far, I do want to acknowledge that for those of us that are in the Kelowna area, and as we approach uh, the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, I do want to acknowledge that we are gathered on the uh, traditional unceded territory of the Seal Okanagan people. We thank them for their rich history and culture, encourage everyone to wear their orange this coming Thursday. Today, it's a writer's guide to business and life, lots of reflections and a look forward uh, based on some of the knowledge that Rick Hansenson has gained. It's great to have Rick in our own backyard now living up at Predator Ridge, global travel writer, uh, business leader and former CEO with Tourism Vancouver. Rick will be more formally introduced in just a few moments. I do want to acknowledge those that make the work that we do here at the Kelowna Chamber possible, including our close to 1,000 members, led by our President Circle members, including MMP Accounting, Rogers for Business, Interior Savings, and UBC Okanagan. We also want to acknowledge our growth and Catalyst members as that uh, um, tier continues to grow. The various logos are up on your screen. They help make the work that we do as we don't receive any government funding. It's basically business helping business moving forward, something we've been doing for 115 years the uh, age of the Kelowna Chamber of Commerce here in the Okanagan. Also want to acknowledge our affinity program partner, Chamber Group Insurance, delivered by TD Benefits here in Kelowna. If you ever want to talk about the number one extended healthcare program in Canada for small business, give us a shout here and we'll let you know. As I mentioned off the top, uh, next month, we'll be welcoming back Tim McMillan, from uh, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. He will be speaking to the role that Canada's natural gas oil uh, sector will play in economic recovery as we move uh, to economic recovery in dealing with the pandemic. Just a reminder, as we continue to deal with the, the pandemic, uh, we have worked closely with many of our chambers and boards of trade throughout the Okanagan under our coalition. You can find a wealth of information to help you see your way through the pandemic if you're a small business owner, including the most recently produced resource guide for small business resiliency. It's download, downloadable at okanagan.com. Uh, uh, COVID or Okanagan, we've got this. Uh, dot com. Sorry about that. And just a reminder: uh, show local some love. Uh, we've just launched our nomination period for our business excellence awards. There are sixteen categories. What better way to say you appreciate the work of small business by going online and nominating them for uh, business excellence awards? You can find more information on the chamber website. Thanks to Ferris and Interior Savings for their presenting sponsorship uh, status with the Business Excellence Award being partners again this year. Next, uh, Business Smarts on the 26th of October, we're going to talk about how technology can help SMEs. Look for more information. Murray Cabell, the president and CEO of Aquarius Solutions, will be joining us. You know, some case uh, studies of how small businesses have tapped into technology and uh, resource planning to be more effective, particularly given the labor challenges we are all facing. At this point, I'm gonna bring in Jonathan from the Okanagan School of Business. Jonathan Rouse joins us. 
He is the Associate Dean. Jonathan, great to have you here. And thanks again for your continued partnership. And to turn things over uh, to provide a few short words on behalf of the School of Business, getting all, you're probably not, I'm not getting all, you are geared up and, and uh, hard at work. So over to you. Many, uh, many thanks, Dan. Yes, uh, um, just want to extend a warm welcome to everybody to today's session. And uh, yeah, as Dan alluded to, we're, we transitioned back to face-to-face uh, -face classes as of September. And I'd like to share with everyone that uh, that transition has gone phenomenally well. Uh, I think students, faculty and staff are very pleased to be uh, back in classes and, and sharing uh, their experiences. Uh, we still have probably about 20% of our courses still online, but uh, we've moved the bulk of it back face-to-face. -face. One other uh, item I'd like to share with everyone, which most of you are probably familiar with. There's uh, there's two of us in the School of Business that are associate deans, myself, and for many years, my counterpart was Barry McGilvery. Barry has recently retired, and uh, I'm very, uh, very pleased to welcome back into our fold uh, as, the, uh, as the new associate dean here at the School of Business, uh, Laura Turn here. Uh, you've, uh, many of you probably have met or know Laura very well. She was our chair for the business department for many, many years, and uh, we're, we're thrilled to have Laura back into, uh, into the fold here at the Okanagan School of Business as the uh, new associate dean. And uh, just on a personal note, um, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled and pleased that we have Rick Antonson joining us today uh, as, our, as our speaker. I've known Rick for many, many years. In fact, I had the honor and pleasure of being on the board of Tourism Vancouver during the 2010, 20, 2010 Olympics and certainly witness uh, Rick's leadership uh, skills, but more importantly is his, his wisdom and his tenacity and his ability to pull people together and, and to build that vision and build that direction on, on, on large scales. And so um, Rick is, is, is a brilliant speaker to join us today to share some of his thoughts as we, as we look into the future. So I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to today's session. So uh, again, welcome everybody on behalf of uh, Okanagan College and the Okanagan School of Business. Well, Jonathan, uh, thanks. Um, if uh, Rick, and we're going to bring his camera on here soon because uh, I'm sure he'd be blushing. Um, I want to thank uh, Rick for joining us. Uh, I'm going to bring in Dan Price as well. I'm going to turn things this over to him in just a moment. But uh, I, I appreciate this opportunity just to, to even uh, touch base, uh, Jonathan, to learn something new. I didn't realize you were involved in that. So uh, I want you to hang on and stay with us because maybe we'll uh, bring bring you back for some tough questions about what transpired during, uh, I'm sure, uh, when you look back, it's all fond memories, but there are all, obviously there were some big challenges, not the least of which was the lack of snow, but we'll We'll, we'll maybe uh, <laughs> chat with you uh, back in, 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 a, in a little bit. So thanks very much. At this stage, I'm going to turn things over. It's a pleasure to have uh, the vice president uh, on the board for the Kelowna Chamber, Dan Price, joining us uh, to bring greetings on behalf of uh, President Jeff and, and the board. Dan, over to you. Well, good. And, and fun little fact on the 2010 Olympics, it was uh, actually our company that hauled in the snow from uh, the park <laughs> to make it look really good on TV. So uh well, yeah, I, I'm going to I'm going to add in. So the guy that was running the ski hill was a guy by the name of Brad Suey. And I remember talking to him at the Olympics and he, from the hill. And he said, you know, they just say do whatever it costs. And I go, don't tell that to the government or don't tell that to the media. But uh, so, yeah, small world. Nice. Dan. Yeah, nice. Sure. Yeah. Great. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the board of directors of the Kelowna Chamber, I'm pleased to welcome you all to this event. First off, I'd like to thank the Okanagan School of Business for their partnership and support of our speaker series. So I'm very excited to introduce our speaker for today's presentation. Rick Antonson was president and CEO of Tourism Vancouver for 21 years, leaving in 2014 to concentrate on writing books. Over the years, he served as the volunteer president of Pacific Coast Public Television and spearheaded many community initiatives, such as the taxi driver training delivered to over 10,000 drivers through the Justice Institute of BC. Rick was co-founder of the annual Keep Vancouver Spectacular Cleanup Project, now we're 30 years in operation, and co-launched Tickets Tonight with the Cultural Alliance, eventually selling millions of dollars worth of cultural event tickets each year. We've invited Rick to speak to us today about what does your business, what does 2023 and beyond look like for your business? So we know he's going to make a few risky predictions, back them up with rationale, and provide some ideas for our community and your business. We trust that he'll drift into his favorite long-term planning philosophy, culture, cathedral thinking, 
as we contemplate our city and region's future. And if there's time, we hope you'll talk about his most recent book, Walking with Ghosts in Papua New Guinea, or his forthcoming book, Train Beyond the Mountains, Journeys on the Rocky Mountaineer. So please join me today in welcoming Rick Antonson. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan and Dan and Jonathan, and of course, also benefited from the involvement of Caroline and, and Lauren and, and others that have brought this about to me, uh, me being able to join today with business leaders, education leaders, students, other professionals. And I'll talk about a, a range of things as has been indicated and certainly want to go back and reference the, 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 the Olympics and, and all that happened around that and maybe talk about some of the things that went right, some of the things that went wrong and, and lessons learned there and, and elsewhere. And while much of what I'm going to reference is applicable to anyone in business, of course, I, I do bring a, a, a writer's perspective now because that's, that's what I do full time in terms of writing books. So it is applicable in my view that, 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 that writing the narrative of your business is like writing the narrative of, of a book with, with some goals in mind and unfolding scenes and, and how you try to, to adapt. But also I'll tend to have examples or a perspective through the lens of tourism because that has been my background. And in fact, Dan and colleagues caught the last picture of me wearing a tie, which is just a little dated because living in Predator Ridge, it's, it's, uh, I don't, don't think I even own any ties anymore. So it was a nice quick snapshot of, of memories. When we talk about 23, 2023 and, and beyond, and that's where I want to get. And then as Dan indicated into the philosophy of long range planning with cathedral thinking, and then put a marker down say for 2030 when we're ideally all going to be looking back what eventually becomes a successful decade of the 2020s. But in, in looking at 2023, and just before we get there, it's important to realize that the tourism industry is brawling its way back to some semblance of, of comfort and that that struggle will continue next year. And before we get to what could be a good and refreshing year of 2023, we will see a continued challenge on the labor front for all manner of businesses. We are going to continue to, to see, certainly from a, a community or a tourism viewpoint, lots of data that is going to make people uncomfortable, if not frightened. When one talks about the hospitality industry, for example, just one sector of the restaurant business, if there are no patrons, it's not just, of course, to state the obvious, that there's no need for the wait staff or for those in food preparation. But if there's no fish going to be served, there's no need for the refrigeration truck that delivers the fresh fish, nor the fishers, nor the people repairing their boats, nor the people repairing refrigeration units. The supply chain impact of not having a strong, sustainable, viable tourism industry, which is where we are now, and I would say will be adapting to in 2022, has so many repercussions. And, and you know, when no one's staying in hotels or it's, it's sporadic at best, there's not been a need in those months of nine or 12% occupancy in many accommodation units, there, there's, there's no one re required to do the laundry or repair the equipment at the laundromat or pave the street in front of the hotel or paint the hotel or refurbish things. So the, the, the splash zone of negative economic hurt is considerable when the tourism industry is not going. So let's talk about 2023. About a year ago, I wrote an opinion editorial for the Vancouver Sun and began with the phrase, let's talk about 2023, saying notionally that, that January of 2023 
may begin to look like January of 2019. And where were we in January of 2019? Well, we had high consumer confidence in all manner of things from purchasing real estate to, to uh, investing in businesses, to feeling confident about their own employment, to making holiday plans. And in January of 2019, which we hope can begin to be replicated in January of 2023, there were people who had August or September holidays that they paid for three or four months earlier. That's how confident they were they'd be able to have time off, money in the bank, the ability and flexibility to travel. May we see that again in our near future? I would submit that we won't see that until at earliest January of 2023. But beyond consumer confidence, there is also that ability to travel. And, and for that, if we're thinking of people coming to Kelowna, coming to the Okanagan, coming into the province of British Columbia, spending their money, what might 2023 begin to look like? Well, could we have those 160,000 jobs in just the hospitality and tourism sector that we had when we were beginning 2019? Could we again see something like 19,500 active direct tourism associated businesses knowing that their cash flow was there, catching up on obligations to investors, attracting new investors? Could we see us back there again? Could we see in the year 2023 that just one industry, broad though it is, delivers 21 and a half billion dollars of visitor spending, which in turn positions four and a half billion dollars at civic, federal, provincial tax coffers. That would be a return to 2019 January. That's all that was on the horizon. But if we want that into your business plans, if we want that into our collective thinking, if we want that to deliver the cash register rings, as well as benefits to tourism that are social and cultural and economical, then we're gonna to have to be thinking about what could be our future return to source markets. So you know, one example is that we've been relying on British Columbians, fellow British Columbians and Albertans for the vast bulk of visits, the vast bulk of spending. And what we know is the average British Columbian traditionally on holidays spends less and all of their activities than does a foreign visitor, particularly those traveling with American dollars or with the Euro, Japanese yen, other currencies, foreign currencies. They tend to be more spent, bigger in their spending and do a wider variety of cultural activities of acquiring some nice piece of art to take home with them. There's a, a variation in their spending. So we want our 6 million overnight visitors back and we'll get some back next year but more in 2023 so in our planning we need to kind of stage up and again i stress i'm looking through the tourism lens but its applicability is is vast and and we have some some serious cautions to keep in mind as we worry or fret or just be practical about what things could look like so for example, while we want American visitors to be coming back, the United States coming out of an economic hit, traditionally, without exception, favors staying close to home in the year or two after the revival, after the resuscitation, after they're saying, okay, we're back. And that can look quite awkward. We've seen in the past where states say, pass legislation to keep convention delegates within their state, not allowing income tax deductions for people who travel to a business meeting or business conference outside of their state or outside of the USA. That could be on the horizon. That is one consideration to apply when you also see a forecast that in 2022, we could see many sectors of the economy, many measures among the eight major ones, that are 100% approved 
and 2021 over 2020, but they are coming from a low base. So while that is heartening, it's kind of disheartening compared to where we were in 2018, early 2019. But we'll have other source markets of visitors, their spending, their willingness to bring investment, and that could be reflected in, in reduced business travel, because as it bounces back, attendance at events could be stagnant, and attendance at conferences certainly will be, as people have gotten away from sending four people on airplanes, the cost of accommodation, everything to attend a convention, and now find they can have three live stream and only one person go and participate. So the, the, the spinoff on that will be significant to areas like the, the, the Okanagan, the entire Okanagan. Um, you know, when, when we would see conventions coming throughout the province or sporting events coming throughout the province, I know from data from the Vancouver Convention Center, you know, the, the, the number of eggs they served that weren't coming from the Vancouver area, but were coming from elsewhere. The number of bottles of Okanagan wine that they would serve to the tens of thousands of delegates attending conventions on an annual basis. Same thing is true in hotel size meetings. When those meetings aren't happening, none of that is happening. Nor, of course, the supply chain peculiar to everything from delivery of that product to the nurturing of that product to the fertilizers required and so forth. All of that can go somewhat, somewhat uh, to the wayside. So where will we be in 2023? We are going to see a return, I would forecast, of, of much of what we had in January of 2019 in a happy way. But on the horizon are continued threats for that. So when the cruise ship business started to come back at the the, the desire of Alaska, it used to be that they had to travel from an American destination or point of origin, stop within a foreign, read Canada destination, and then on to a port in Alaska. What happened was American Senate and Congress passed a temporary measure to allow them to bypass Canada. So cruises boarding in Seattle could go straight to Alaska. And that was a temporary measure. Of course, Canada had said no cruise ships this year or last year, maybe not until next year. But today, yesterday, a Senator from Alaska is proposing to the American Senate to make that permanent. Now, the Vancouver cruise business seems a long way from Kelowna. But one of the things I used to say in, in, in marketing Vancouver was that no one came from Europe all the way to Vancouver for two nights. They would come all the way from Europe for two or three weeks in British Columbia. And they would come and land in Alberta, see the Rockies, travel in the Okanagan. They would be ambitious to get maybe on a cruise out of Vancouver, but they wouldn't come all this way without seeing Kelowna without seeing this wonderful part of the world, without learning about Canadian wines, without Canadian taking Canadian product home. So that became a point of considerable aggravation. If they're not going on the cruise, they may not come for the rest of those travels and the economic spinoffs may not happen. But let's park that for a moment because I, I, I think the importance of the next couple of years and getting into 2023 is to see the decade thrive. And that means we've got to take a bit of a look at putting our marker down for 2030. And just before I get specific about the year 2030 and some of what we might reflect on then, some of what we might do, the, 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 the whole concept of long range planning is about, as far as I can determine, short term action for long term benefits. It is about doing things today that we know are putting in place a better 2022 which could deliver this type of perspective for 2023, but it's got to be leading somewhere. So in the not too distant horizon, that could be the year 2030. A philosophy on long range planning that, that is close to my heart is called cathedral thinking. And you can read lots about this by, by, by Googling or going to cathedralthinking.com. But at, at the heart of it is doing today things that will bear fruit, yes, in the short term satisfaction and so forth, but you're really putting in 
place things that will deliver benefits in the longer term. But if you don't do them today, you're not going to have those beneficial things in the, in the long term. Going back some years, my uh, wife Janice, who's in aviation marketing, was, was posted as head of aviation and marketing with the Edinburgh Airport, worked with British Airport authorities. So we were in Edinburgh over Christmas and New Year's. And on Christmas Eve, we went to St. Mary's Cathedral. And it was an awesome night with maybe a thousand other people in this huge, huge building. And afterwards, we were walking back, had a glass of wine and got talking about the people who built cathedrals over the, the, the centuries. And that led us to talking about cathedral thinking. So I'm going to give you a, a Reader's Digest version of cathedral thinking. It's a, a concept I've had the opportunity to present on all over the world in Bogota and Colombia or Tokyo or Berlin or Basel, Switzerland. And it's, it's a longer unfolding, but, but the shorter version is, is this. And I, I, I want to begin with a question because Albert Einstein once said, if he had one hour to solve a problem or meet a challenge, he would spend 55 minutes making sure he got the question right. So I have a question for you. What is it you can do individually, collectively, starting today that will bring short-term satisfaction and results, but a long-term benefit that others can enjoy? So when we had left St. Mary's Cathedral and we're talking about cathedral thinking, you get quite quickly into those who were building the cathedrals. And an example I will use is if one of you, male or female, was an architect in the 1600s and your community came to you and said, will you design a new cathedral for our town, our city? You would begin that task knowing that you may not live to see your work completed. You would, however, have a cathedral thought. You would be asking yourself some question about, well, who's going to follow on on this? Am I doing things in the right way? And I, I think it, it, it's, so, it, it's so important because, and this is a lesson I've, I've learned over time, it's not what we do that matters. It's what we cause to happen. Say, on the other hand, you were a stonemason and you were putting the foundation blocks in place, the cornerstone. You again would be asking yourself, others are going to build upon this. Am I building a strong foundation? And, and you would know that you're not going to be around when the re end result is there, but what you're doing now is building toward that. And, and it, it is another truism that we each should be involved in unfinished work. It's not getting everything done right now. It's putting in place things that others can continue to build upon. If you were an artisan and you were doing the stained glass windows, you wouldn't be at that stage early on, but you would be trying to align with the design. You'd be trying to source the materials, get the lead for the leaded glass. All along, what you looked at on a daily base was changing right in front of you. And, and you would be learning another important lesson about long-term planning. And it is this, what was, isn't, what is, won't be. And a, a real tight short, because I don't want to get on to 2030 and I'm mindful of our time. Another short bit is that at Oxford they, in, in 1638, they, they, they built a, a, a wonderful, big new college with these beams that went all across and came this way and they supported the ceiling and they were awesome. Then 500 years later, they had bug problems and resulting dust and they were deteriorating and they had to be replaced. And so the fellow in the you know, late 1900s who was chored with finding replacement for the, the roof went to the college forester and said, is there by any chance a, a group of trees within our forest that could be used for replacement of the roof? And reportedly the, the, the college forester said, we've been waiting to you. We've been waiting for you. 
For 500 years, my family passed down from generation to generation to generation the information that when the new college was built in 1638, that grove of trees over there was planted. So it would be big and strong and ready when the roof needed to be replaced. Cathedral thinking. That plays out in all sorts of activities we see in the world. Cathedral thinking today has been applied to everything from water preservation to, to uh, land conservation, to social movements, to the, 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 the doing complicated things that can't be solved shortly. But it also is important in a, a Kelowna Cathedral thinking place to keep in mind that, that looking for a vision, setting something for 2030 or longer also needs to be, feel like it's progressing on a, a regular basis. So let's, while well, I could go on for quite some time on cathedral thinking, I, 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 I wanna kind of cut that short, but say that it is a way to keep the living generation tethered to the future. And in doing so, one looks at benchmarks down the road. We did this when we launched the bid to bring the Olympics to Vancouver. We did it when we initiated the, the taxi host driving driver training program or, or launched Dine Out, which has become the, the became the, the, the largest off-season um, uh, restaurant promotion in North America. All of those weren't about the first year or two. They were about 10 years down the road or 20 years down the road. So looking at 2030 with an eye on Kelowna and the Okanagan, there is, of course, a province-wide opportunity that has been posed by John Furlong, headed up the Olympics in 2010 and, and by others. And that is to look at the year 2030 with the entire province of British Columbia hosting the Winter Olympics. And the concept that is being talked about now is not Whistler and Vancouver and Richmond as the host communities. It is about a province-wide hosting. Clearly, the IOC is now receptive to that type of an idea. And that pick a sport that is relevant, but to say that uh, the figure skating or curling could be hosted Pan Okanagan in 2030 is absolutely workable under the concept that is being put together. And we should make no mistake about it. This is being worked at all of the senior levels within Canada, within British Columbia to look at the prospects of providing the IOC with a program that would show British Columbia committed to hosting in perhaps eight or a dozen different communities throughout the province, hosting the 2030 Winter Olympics. This is workable. I, I, I wrote for the Vancouver province uh, an op-ed piece a few months ago that talked about 2030, building on, on John Furlong's suggestion. And, and it began with, with, are we bold enough? Is British Columbia game to do something like that? Would the Kelowna's and Okanagan's of the province come and participate in something like that? When we launched the bid to bring the 2010 Olympics to Vancouver, we, we launched it with, with a, a billboard campaign and, and a bus shelter, a side of buses, and it said, can you imagine? And it was, can you imagine inviting the world? Can you imagine hosting the world? So I, I, I pose that knowing that, that, that some of you participating in this today and within the chamber have undoubtedly contemplated what this could look like because it's not a secret concept, but fortune favors the bold. And I would say that applying cathedral thinking to get us doing the right things in the remainder of 2021, struggling through getting the foundation in place in 2022 and seeing 2023 beginning to foreshadow and build toward a really substantive decade. Is it not exciting to think in 2030 that our part of the province could be part of hosting the world having invited the world and benefited from all the work that certainly we saw this in the Metro Vancouver area, all of the activity and construction, everything that came about 
working up to the games, the pre-events, the going to the ski hills, to the trials, to everything, to conferences that needed to meet somewhere, all of those benefits. But one of the things that we saw coming out of 2010 was that the following decade was growth upon growth, upon opportunity, upon business investment, upon lots of people finding that there were immense benefits to the communities and the provinces, and those benefits were economic for sure, but social, cultural, and environmental. And one can begin to dream that 2030 could deliver hosting the Olympics a decade following the 2030s to be remarkable for British Columbia, for the Okanagan, and for Kelowna. And I think if you can imagine this is a good place for me to wrap up, perhaps talk about some questions that you have or other ideas, answer things, and I'll, I'll stop because my temptation is to go into the next phase of babbling. But I think right now, it's a good idea to stop and uh, take some questions and, and hear some responses. Well, thanks very much, uh, Rick. Um, and certainly, I suspect you sparked uh, a lot of reflection of those that have joined us. So anybody that uh, is with us, if you want to use the Q&A function uh, or, or the chat function uh, to raise a question, uh, feel free to do that. Uh, I do have a couple lingering ones uh, to get us starting uh, started. But I also want to invite uh, Jonathan and Dan, if they're still uh, with us on the panelist side, if you want to join the uh, if that sparks some thoughts, uh, Jonathan, and any questions, uh, please jump in. Uh, I, one of the things that struck me early on when you were talking, Rick, and, and just to kick it off, um, we are facing, you know, it's funny, I was saying to somebody the other day in the Okanagan, you wouldn't know there's a pandemic with the house prices that, they, that they're at and such a low unemployment rate, but it's a reflective of uh, the labor challenge we, we face. And so when you crystal ball and and look towards 2022, 2023, uh, as you noted, and then all of a sudden there is an upturn, but we're now facing significant labor challenges and some of those that were in working in the hospitality or looking at other options. What steps do we do? And maybe that's that cathedral thinking that foundation is, is the labor side because so much of this is um, of the experience of the travelers. So. Where would you start in, in trying to address uh, some of that labor shortages that we're facing now in a sector that when it starts to ramp up mm -hmm. is really going to need? What advice do you give, whether it's the chambers or business, small businesses in the sector? Well, and, and I wouldn't say that it's advice, so I would try and offer, offer some, some context or some perspective, because one of the difficulties in the tourism industry forever has been the seasonality. And something that I, I know I've encountered in talking in the, the, the sort of Okanagan area with, with people working in, in, say, the restaurant business or the accommodation sector is that one of the difficulties in attracting employees has been that they can't say, and you've got a job for the entire next year. Because many people have come back to work, and I was talking to uh, one person in a restaurant who was, was just beginning to lay down some of the debt sheet accumulated recently when being out of work and all of a sudden their capacity was reduced her hours were reduced so i think part of it is having a vision and plans that are going to provide sustainable employment for people and attract them i do think um, that the, the Kelowna area is going to be able to attract workers from other part of the parts of the province once people begin to see that they can move with confidence and be be able to sustain their move to the area. Granted, housing costs have, have gone up. But I think labor shortages will continue to be a challenge and the parts of the province or parts of the country that solve those are gonna be the ones that can benefit from the more sustained tourism period. Yeah. We had a recent discussion with someone here talking about seniors in the workforce, a lot of retirees that still are very active with such knowledge. So can we create more uh, and a better work environment for seniors that uh, recognizes, you know, where they are in life and, and get them Smart back idea. engaged in the workforce, yeah. right? Smart. We got a couple of questions, uh, Rick, I'm going to go online and, and then Jonathan, uh, if you have one, I'll let you jump in. But the first one, uh, can you speak to the need to plan for the unforeseeable issues 
when you apply cathedral thinking to a project. Uh, as an example, how early in the 2010 planning process did you have plans for lack of snow? Will this become <laughs> even more important as, for example, seeing the increasing impact of climate change, which frankly, uh, as noted here, we sh likely should have seen, uh, but un unforeseen events. How do, you, how do you use that cathedral thinking in that regard? Thanks for the question. So I, I, yeah, I like the question. Uh, a couple of things. First of all, uh, educators, and Jonathan could speak to this, and I, I know certainly from some of my reading, and I can't speak to, to local incidents, but, but educators in tourism and hospitality now, but also in, in all other aspects of business, are looking for ways to actually structure courses so that people in, in business training and going out into the workforce are educated around uncertainty because we will live with abject uncertainty for the coming five mm -hmm. years. That, that we're going to have COVID excuses and we're going to have COVID confusion. This is not going away. So part of it is making sure that new people, new leaders, and those who have gone through what we've gone through are able to apply uh, emergency measures, how to deal with emergencies, how to deal with the unforeseen. There are always pockets in the communities that were doing that, usually first responders or their, their entities, but now everyone's beginning to find that. You know, and, and living in Predator Ridge, we were, we were, we could at night see the skies from the forest fires. So what people were planning how to adapt, that was just us as residents. What about individuals running businesses? I think with cathedral thinking, there are many, many examples of when they started to design a big cathedral. At the start, for example, they didn't know much about using cornerstones to brace the walls as they were going up. That was a product of an architect saying, we're gonna build this and figuring out how to do it. They would enter things, for example, for the, the, the center bridge when they did an arch. When they build original arches, you can actually see this in, in, um, in, in movies about cathedrals because they'll, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll put down these where they would try to build doorways that were like this and they'd collapse until they could put in that center stone. That evolved. So it's, it's people finding, finding ways to, finding solutions. Uh, and I think that the, the, the biggest thing we're finding now in terms of seeing our way out of the, the, the COVID crisis is trying to find solutions that will put all of those, that basket of uncertainties behind us. Because until we put it behind us, we're not going to be able to go forward properly. Those that, that, that grew up in the 60s or 70s might remember in the, 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 the race movement in, in America, um, Eldridge Cleaver, an, an activist, wrote a book called Soul on Ice. And in it, he coined the phrase, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. That is crystal clear right now in solving COVID. It's also going to be crystal clear in solving what 22, 23, and onward looks like. Excellent. Jonathan, did you have any thoughts on that to, to add to that or query? No, I mean, Rick, you're, you're spot on in terms of, uh, you know, students in the future are going to need to understand or, or be aware of that degree of uncertainty. And, you know, certainly within the School of Business here at Okanagan College, we're, uh, we're working on a brand new initiative that we're going to launch next year. It's experiential entrepreneurship. And it is very experiential. It's very applied. We're getting students into their particular sectors. And part of that is to learn, experience, and, and uh, reflect on all aspects of entrepreneurship, with one of them being that degree of uncertainty and risk and how you manage it. So it's uh, you're spot on. I, I, I find it really encouraging to hear that um, at, at the Provincial Tourism Conference in Victoria, which was March of... of 2019, little did any of us know it was the last one we were going to be at. And I'd been invited to be on a panel talking about the benefits of uh, the Olympics 10 years later. But a week before, they put on a new panel on crisis management mm -hmm. that was specific to what was unfolding as we thought po possibly a crisis because of, of COVID. And I remember I, I was a part of it because we encountered so many economic crises or 9-11 or things that were disruptive to the, the, the industry's plans. One of the things I said at the time, because China air links had just been canceled, was that 
the industry didn't yet know if it had a health crisis because that wasn't announced as a pandemic, but they did have a marketing crisis. And I think back to, to Dan's question or the, the, the question that, it, that, that, that he read that had come in is that lots of people will be wondering what the future looks like only to find false starts, only to find that adaptability is more important than sticking with the original plan, only to find that what they thought was gonna happen in three years has happened in one year, or what they thought was gonna happen in one year takes three years. So that ability, the training that, that many of us never had but found ourselves in decision-making positions trying to engineer a solution, having that training for new entrepreneurs, existing entrepreneurs, to have crisis management, a, a regular part of the year of, of, of sessions that a, a, a chamber has or a, a region has, so important because we are going into, into a, a decade of adaptability and those who adapt will be Darwinian success stories. Those who do not will be economic roadkill. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, a couple of years back, uh, we actually hosted uh, some of our colleagues from Calgary that talked about emergency planning uh, after the big flood in Calgary and uh, how businesses yes. were unprepared. Do you think we could get people out? Oh, that would never happen here. Oh, you know, <laughs> only when a crisis occurs do people, you know, I should plan for a crisis, but actually you, you do that before. And there's lots of uh, great resources out there uh, to help small businesses kind of think about uh, yes. contingencies and planning. And this summer has been a good reminder on a number of levels. So, uh, Rick, um, and just for those that are joining, uh, we've got time for a few more questions. So if you want to jump in and get one or two more questions in, uh, Rick's been really gracious with his time. Just to note, if you hang in there, um, another author, Stephen Harper, uh, former prime minister uh, left us a few books. I'm going to give away a book to someone that hangs in there uh, to the end. And I'm not sure, did we uh, say you're going to give away a book or did you offer Rick or am I putting you on the spot? <laughs> you know, I, we're, oh, I, we're going to plug your books, right? I yeah. think you just did. Okay. <laughs> not yet. Uh, we're we're going to come, we're going to come back to it. Okay, we're going to come back and you tell us about that book in a moment. But uh, I do want to respect, we got one more question in the queue here. Uh, the question with global tourism stripped back, uh, this is from Michelle uh, to zero in 2020. And, and now as you put it, brawling its way back. From your experience, what are some fundamental principles of high quality tourism that can best serve the sector and our Okanagan operators today in building back better uh, to be thriving again by 2030. What's those building oh, blocks? Boy, that's a big one. Yeah. session on itself. <laughs> and I, I, I love the notion of, of, of our addressing that because I think it starts with something that the Okanagan and, and Kelowna has in spades, and that's authenticity. Because, you know, like, like the wines that have come up out of here, the, uh, the golf courses, and I'm new to that, that sport. I, I played baseball twice a week all summer at empty stadiums in, in Burnham because other leagues weren't able to get out and, and, and be playing. But those, the, the sort of the, the, the sport, the lifestyle, the, 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 the lakes, the people who come uh, originally for a night stay and end up spending three or four nights in this area, they do it because they're discovering things that they hadn't, weren't prepared to be able to enjoy it for whatever reason on their own side. And I, I think it just happens wonderfully here. So I think authenticity is there. The other thing, and this is a notion that comes with the Olympics and thinking Olympic style, is that if, for example, Kelowna and the Okanagan were pointing to 2030 and thinking of the Olympics, the Olympics are all about gold. Any athlete, any parent, any coach planning on going to the Olympics for years before, they're not thinking bronze because if they think they can do bronze, they're only nanoseconds or a gold away from doing silver. And if you're that close with silver, you're thinking gold. What it led us to in Vancouver, and I think would lead the Okanagan and Kelowna to, is that with the Olympics on the horizon, everything you think about is gold. So your service in the hospitality industry, your taxi industry, the structure, the architecture, the look of your community, the wayfinding for visitors, everything has to be of a gold standard. Bronze no longer is sufficient. And, and another thing that happens with the Olympics where they'd be coming to this part of the province is that the Olympics are like a train. They go through and when they're gone, all you have left is your reputation. 
So putting in place uh, the, the factors to build on the authenticity, the variety, the, uh, the, the sports and lifestyle that is the Okanagan fits so well with that look throughout the entire decades of the 2020s. Sorry about that, Rick. That's okay. Getting coordinated. Hey, uh, one question that I, that I had, and then and, uh, this will be the last chance for others to, to jump in. Uh, I, I was struck a number of years ago uh, when I was uh, on a tour into China of the knowledge <laughs> Uh, the, the Chinese have of, of Canada and, and BC. And it was almost the first generation of, of travelers yes. um, coming into Canada, uh, but they were going to the Toronto's, the Vancouver's. Uh, are we prepared for the next generation of travelers from Asia? Um, because they're coming. Uh, the question is when and, and where are they coming? Are they likely to get to some of the other regions? You, many years in Vancouver, you know the impact uh, that that's uh, made to, in, in Metro Vancouver in that area and the tourism. Is that something we, we should be considering um, you know, as that next generation opens up? Uh, travel for the, certainly Chinese is, is much more significant now. And when you look at scale and population, uh, that's a heck of a market, right? Right. And I, I would say that separate China from the rest of Asia, because the best example of how to handle future generations of China will be how the uh, visitor behavior changed over the decades coming out of Japan, because initially it was very tour heavy and it was literally seven days. It was Vancouver and they only landed in Vancouver because that's how far the plane could go. They wanted to see Banff. They wanted to see not Toronto, but Niagara Falls. And the Japanese, particularly the woman, wanted to go see Anna Green Gables because the English language schooling after the war was Little Redhead and the book. It was Mecca in a, a travel sense for them. But subsequent generations then began large tours and then began to hive off. So you would have young university women or university students. You had independent travel, willingness to rent cars and so forth. So you can track how that happened and they began to spread around the province. China will do that as well. I would say with China, there is uh, just to hit the pause button, a bit of a caution of be careful what one wishes for because it can overwhelm and become too much of a good thing. Japan provides another example. Banff lost its appeal to American visitors because of all the Japanese language signing, the predisposition to think that the Japanese were the only ones spending money. And Banff in the American market got the reputation of Tokyo in the Rockies. So, so it, it lost its appeal for people who wanted what 20 years ago, 30 years ago for uh, more was the, hey, the Banff, the Rockies. So I would caution on not wanting too much of one thing. But that can be nurtured. It has to be nurtured with a step off point. That's going to be Vancouver. A challenge for the Kelowna Airport will be getting back all of the air service it used to have. But then is there going to be an opportunity for more flights out of Kelowna now because governments are going to think different about licensing rights maybe than they were willing to do before with a broader open skies. So, but, but um, the, the potential is there. Uh, you just don't want um, you don't want an, an imbalance, and you want your fellow British Columbians have discovered this province. And what have they discovered by being forced that if you want to travel, you have to stay home? Are they learning about our history? Are they learning about where we came from as a province? Do they share a vision of where we're going to go? I was uh, struck a number of months ago uh, when the lockdown into the U.S. was more than currently with a, a tour, a golf tour operator out of eastern uh, Canada who organizes Canadians uh, into Arizona, into California, mm -hmm. uh, into other states for golf tours. And he said, he can't organize that. He said, uh, I'm thinking about the Okanagan, but whereabouts are you? <laughs> and and it, it was a reminder, oh, right, not everyone knows uh, all the aspects and the beauty that we have and the opportunities we have as an example. And it was great to have the BC Golf Championship yes. recently, the sport yes. tourism. Well done. And I know uh, Tom Dias is on uh, with us, the former president uh, and chair of uh, the chamber board. I, I think he's waiting, as many of us, for the Memorial Cup uh, to come here. So uh, yeah. sport, sport tourism means a lot for this region. So just sure. in closing... You know, we hear a little bit on the Olympics in 2030. So you're, are you in tune and, and they are working on that kind of structure you're talking about in definitive terms and serious yes. efforts? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I can I can speak to that. In fact, I'm going to send two important people a note when I get off of this and say that we talked about it. Uh, I can tell you, I, I probably shouldn't name the individuals, but but the two individuals who are absolutely pivotal to this happening. Uh, but I, I don't want to. But we we talked for an hour earlier uh, this time last week. Um, I, I know that that they would be excited if uh, uh, Kelowna and Okanagan uh, decided to tether themselves to, to that type of, of a vision. I'd be happy to put you in touch with, uh, with, with them, but they, they are the ones and this is happening and there are timelines on structuring it. I would say that they've, they will benefit from a mistake that we made when we went bold about the bidding for 2010. We did that in the mid 1990s, as I mentioned, can you imagine was the, the theme. We hadn't lined up enough support behind it. So when we went public, we got headwinds that we didn't necessarily have to encounter. They are so good, so professional, so experienced. They are going to build that support before getting sort of um, more public about it, but they are doing all the right things. I think this is a very real possibility and the opportunity for Kelowna and the Okanagan is real. The 2030 opportunity. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Jonathan, any final thoughts before we wrap up? Yeah, my, my only thought yeah. from, a, from a, a tourism perspective and, and from the COVID pandemic is one of the things that we've certainly learned is how important tourism is to the province. And a lot of people didn't realize they were part of the tourism sector until this happened. And so it's, uh, it's an interesting time for, for the tourism sector and, and moving forward. All right, uh, thanks. Uh, now, uh, Rick, I'm gonna turn it back to you. I, I do wanna thank you uh, for spending some time with us and being flexible. We had hoped to, to be able to do this in person. Uh, you're not that far away. We'll, we'll try to bring you back and maybe talk uh, about that uh, cathedral uh, planning uh, down the road. Uh, but uh, you wanna plug uh, the books? I know you've got a well, couple of books. That... Sure, I, writers need readers. And, yes. and I, I write full time. I, I've uh, a uh, few books that uh, are, are, oh, there you go. Thank you. Yeah, put them up there for I've you. Got, yeah. I've got um, four travel books, a fifth one that is is up there. My most recent was Walking with Ghosts in Papua New Guinea, uh, an arduous trek across uh, the, the, the country. Uh, for those of you that say, no, the grouse grind, as an example, uh, I had to get really fit for this. It was like doing the grouse grind up and down three or four times in a day, five days in a row. It's a brutal brutal trek. If you Google, it's always one of the top five or 10, mm. certainly among the most dangerous uh, and also most, most difficult, but it's a complicated country. Um, but the, the history there of uh, battlements during the Second World War, MacArthur called it the, the worst fighting conditions anywhere in World War II. So that um, is literally, as it says in the title, crossing the Kokoda Trail in the last wild place on earth. It is indeed wild. My forthcoming book, which was to come out um, last fall and, and uh, has been punted now to spring of, of uh, 2023 because of COVID impact on all sorts of different things, not least of which is Rocky Mountaineer that went 24 months without you know, revenue into the company, without, yeah. without being able to be on the rails. And, and they have been running this year, but with numbers more akin to 30 years ago, because they had had record years. You know, they would take into Kamloops, what, 100,000 people a year, that more than the population of, of that place for overnight. I had a tremendous experience on that train. I traveled with my then 10-year-old grandson, Riley. And it's, so it's about that, but it's also about the history, about our province, the development, the politics, all of that around the building of the railway. But we traveled for a lot of days on the train in the Rockies around the province. And one of the things that leads me, and it's a good point maybe to conclude, is that a new type of travel is emerging. It's always been there, but it's coming now. And I'll say two things about this. One is the intergenerational travel, the grandparents, grandchildren, mm -hmm. finding ways to do things like the Rocky Mountaineer. We were among the only ones that were doing that. There's gonna be more of that. But the other thing I think is gonna happen in 2022 or for sure in 2023 is that travel anxiousness will return with a sense of urgency. People for too long have been saying, one day I'm going to do that. They've just found two years of parking one day and they don't want to park one day anymore. 
those that have wanted to come to the Okanagan, those that have wanted to spend a few days in Kelowna, they're going to find a way to do it. It's been on their list. They're not going to make it happen. All right. Uh, we've drawn a couple names here. Uh, which which booker? You've got the book there too? I will donate a copy of, of this to uh, chime in with Harper's donated book. And it's uh, Deanna Steele from Keys to Kelowna. Deanna, congratulations. Uh, Rick might even sign that somewhere along the line. So I congratulations will. Will. to the Deanna. That, I will autograph it. Then it's less difficult. It's more difficult to put on eBay. We'll definitely, yeah, we'll, we'll follow up. And we have uh, Stephen Harper's uh, book. Uh, he signed that when he was here, uh, right here, uh, right now. And that goes to Karen uh, Mazur from the SPCA. Thanks, Karen. And thanks, Deanna. Thanks all for, for joining us, Rick. Uh, you've been very gracious uh, with your time uh, and with our planning. Um, as a token of our appreciation, we'll be making a small donation on your behalf to one of our uh, local nonprofit charities uh, uh, here in uh, Kelowna. So thanks very, very much. Thank you. And uh, just a reminder, this uh, has been recorded. We'll be posting this uh, on our uh, YouTube channel shortly. We'll also uh, have some communication information that we'll providing and following up with all those that registered. Thanks, Rick and Jonathan for joining us as well. Thanks to everyone. Uh, that brings to a close today's uh, OC Speaker Series, a reminder to join us next month as uh, Tim McMillan from CAP uh, joins us. And there's another plug for uh, Rick's books that you can take a look at um, as we move towards the end of today's session. I want to thank uh, all our speakers and our presenters for being part of this and wish you all a great day. Thanks.